All right. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to this quarantine recital. Uh, I hope, as usual, that everyone is doing fine in these still very unusual times. Today, I'm going to play piano sonata by Schubert, his last sonata, the last real piano piece he composed. Uh, which is number Deutsch 960, Sonata in B flat major. <clears throat> so, in uh, two other of these recitals, I played his uh, two sonatas he wrote before that one, the 958, 969. He wrote the three kind of as a group. And I think I gave uh, some quite detailed presentation of uh, those two ones back in the day. And this one, 960, is actually a different beast from 958 and 959. It's, uh, it has a reputation of being kind of mystical, which you know, this is something you could attribute to Schubert being closest to his death while writing this one, even more so than the other ones, which if you look at the biographical facts, the historical facts, this seems not to be quite certain. So even though you couldn't imagine there's lots of influence of concept of death inside this piece, this is not necessarily a real thing in Schubert's mind. But anyway, it does. So this mystical aspect, it comes from really many things. The first thing which uh, you might notice. And this is something I noticed and really thought actively recently when I prepared it for this recital, is that this sonata compared to other ones is much less, I would say, pianistic, in the sense that it's written in much less comfortable ways for the pianist, even though overall it's rather simple technically. There's nothing you could say sounds difficult. It's actually not easy to make, to make sound well. And it is difficult in that sense, like the, the textures, the way things are spread, they're not easy. And there's nothing which is like flashy, sounds hard, but actually is rather easy, which the previous sonatas have a bit of. So this is, you could say this is Schubert uh, expressing a different part of himself that he had a little bit hidden, especially in 958. And the result is a piece of music, music which is very intimate and not show-offy at all. So this is not music you're going to play if you want to impress anyone. But of course, that's not why we're here today. Um, many things to say. I have not prepared this, of course, because I want this to be spontaneous. So it's again, as as the other two sonatas written in four movements, which are more or less connected by various things. Let, uh, let me describe all of them in some detail. The first movement has an interesting tempo marking, which I think you never see anywhere else. It's molto moderato, so very moderate. Almost sounds like a contradiction in two words. But not quite a contradiction, right? So the idea is that it's not fast. It's not too slow either. If you're very moderate, you're not going to exaggerate the slowness. There is a tendency to play it very slow, which is something that Richter did. I'm not going to do that here, at least. I haven't listened to those recordings. I don't think I play this particularly close. And it starts with this wonderful as we said, calm, intimate melody. The interesting thing about this melody, and most of the melodies you're going to hear in the sonata, so this is something worth taking, is that they, the range of notes in the melody is rather short. So here we start on B flat, and Mostly, we go down to A and up to D, but that's only a span of four notes for the whole first part of the melody. Then it goes a little bit farther with B, B flat. 
back. That's not much of our vocal. Then the melody reaches this kind of resting point. And then Schubert does something very surprising and actually really amazing. There's this trill. It's kind of grumble deep down in the piano, which uh, will come back several times in this movement, four or five times. The first time it kind of punctuates the initial melody like that, you can imagine whatever you wanted this to represent, maybe something coming from beyond the grave. And later on, it actually comes in at spots where it kind of defines uh, structurally what happens. Uh, so of course, as usual, this melody gets played around with. There's a second piece, which will, well, there's many secondary pieces which you'll hear later. And I'm not, I'm not going to expand upon that. Though, one thing I want to say, one, one technique, compositional technique that Schubert uses in the sonata a lot is uh, unusual modulations, which basically the way he does it is will be more or less introduced to a key signature, or will be comfortably inside a key signature. And we're going to shift to a new one without any preparation almost. So there's an excellent comic, there's an excellent comic which I need to to show, uh, I'll, I'll find it and put it in chat later on, which uh, shows in a funny way how famous composers do modulation. And Schubert's method is, we're in the old key, cross out the old key, we're not in the new key. And so we get something like that a little bit later. So we end up, the melody ends up as it should be in the flat, and then we have the trill of the different kind of wonderful G flat major, which is all kinds of warm, 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 and feels good. A lot of warmth in this sonata, but not only warmth, because sometimes, sometimes it becomes very dark. But as, as I said, you know, it's not demonstrative, so it never gets really big, at least on the joy or on the show-off aspect. So it rarely gets very loud, and when it does get loud, it's rather for a serious, a little bit dramatic moment, and doesn't necessarily last for very, for very long. It's never, almost never exuberant. The first movement takes, uh, I would say, around 20 minutes. I'm not quite sure. So there are many things get developed on. You'll hear a secondary theme. Some of them will come back. The trill will announce things, and so on. After the first movement, so the first movement ends ends with uh, we'll go through many things, but it ends up rather simply and in comfort, which is, as we said, something that this sonata expresses. Then the second movement comes along, and uh, this one is more about darkness and sadness. Melody. Again, he uses very few notes. And then there's this interesting accompaniment, which goes something like that. We've got a repeated rhythm in the left hand, which never changes as far as the rhythm goes. Well, it changes occasionally, but it's very, you know, it's very doom and gloom. It will not escape the melody, as I said. Not have a big bam. And uh, get an incredible effect given by this movement. And uh, you can't escape death, maybe that's what it means. Except there is a middle part in this movement which is more helpful. But as, uh, as many pieces are composed, this second movement has this more hopeful middle part, and then we return to the gloomy first part. Except it's made even more gloomy because the pattern in the left hand is different. 
something really, really great. However, using the magic of surprise modulations, Schubert manages to relieve us of this pressure a little bit. And then we arrive in the third movement where the pressure is all gone. This one is very carefree and light. You've got this melody. Wrong, whatever, which uh, kind of jumps around and seems even though so there's still this thing where there's not many notes we can understand. And then all of a sudden this one starts jumping around up and down. And you will pass between both hands. Many times we'll have one hand, then the other hand, the right, then left, then right, then left, then right, which uh, which is all pretty good fun. So after the glue, we get more fun. So that's the third movement, little scherzo, and then the last movement, the fourth one, rondo. This one, we it's uh, again a slightly different feeling. It ends up being carefree, but somehow we've uh, internalized that there is darkness hiding behind us. So it's it's happy, but it's not very joyful. And this one has very interesting things happening, which is there's this kind of punctuation which happens repeatedly. These, uh, this octave always come back. You can always count on that to be saying, yes. Yeah, we're going back to the opening theme of that movement, which uh, is a way of signaling, you are home, everything is fine. Well, I guess it's signaling that, but it's also interesting because the modulation is very unusual. So this, this is a G. It's hiding that there's this chord. But this chord makes you believe that you're in C minor. I'm not gonna spend too much time on that. And then it happens that, no, we're not. Uh, so this is a modulation that Schubert explicitly borrows from uh, from Beethoven in one of his, his uh, string quartets, Opus 130. And I've mentioned before that even in the two sonatas, 958 and 959, Schubert manages to insert things which are clearly inspired by Beethoven. He wants to show that he studied the master. Well, the master, those were these uh, these sonatas were composed barely a year after Beethoven died, which is all found really interesting. They never actually met, which is uh, quite tragic. So this, this fourth movement is more carefree. It's not too carefree. It has this wonderful melody in the middle. rather delightful. There, there's a few more dramatic episodes in the middle. We need some of those. But in the end, we really the, the main mood is given by those two melodies. And at the end of this movement, something interesting happens, similar to the last movement of Sonata D959, where this thing gets kind of distorted. Order is returned. 
And then there's the coda. So this is just before the end, and then the actual end, which I'm not going to spoil, I'm not going to play, is all of a sudden an incredible burst of joy and hope for the teacher, which is something completely new, I think, in terms of uh, notions in this sonata, which just burst out of nothing for a very an ending which somehow relieves us of all the tension. Like, even though we had internalized it in some ways, now it's actually completely gone. And the ending, which is hard to, to do well on a digital, but I'll do my best. All right, that's everything I had to say. And I uh, hope this wasn't too long. I talked for 15 minutes. That's really quite a lot. But uh, hopefully this was all interesting. And I'll play now. Enjoy. First, I'll have a drink.
There you go. Right, thank you very much for listening. Quite a few people commented, which is great. Ah, uh, I want to, no sound, uh, there should be sound now actually. I just got the wrong mic for a bit. Uh, let me put the link in the chat for the webcomic I was talking about. Uh, do, 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 which is a great one. Ah, I happened to have it open fairly recently on this uh, laptop, which is interesting. Uh, there you go. You can click on that. So for those who know a little bit about music theory, you and who know about those composers, you will definitely like this. And I just love how Schubert just crosses out old and makes it the new key. Uh, I want to say... So the last movement is interesting. It's kind of what I mentioned. The whole last movement lives in the present, I find, in the way that in in the way that somehow it's a bit carefree but also resigned. Is it resigned about death or is it resigned that you should just enjoy enjoy life? in the simple way you can, or something like that. And then there's these, this very small passage where it gets really, really like uh, all of a sudden we're afraid something is going to happen and it slows down and so on. And then all of a sudden this burst of hope. And I was thinking this burst of hope, it points to the future. And maybe it's the only point in the sonata, where all of a sudden the music points towards the future, it's it's really it's really fascinating. And why am I covering my eyes? I don't know. It just feels comfortable. But uh, it's quite impressive and amazing what the feelings we can get from the music. Like all of this about you know death, the present, the future, and so on, explained only in notes. It's uh, it's quite amazing. Maybe you know, maybe this is just my own interpretation and has actually no foundation whatsoever. But I think most of us will not actually agree with that. Uh, yeah, so much to say. Uh, since we're here, since I've played the three last sonatas in these streams, I I'd like to present my opinion, which is probably controversial, that I like these sonatas. In reverse order, so 958 is my favorite, 959 my second, and this one, 916, my third favorite. That's maybe just because I'm a pianist, and the other two are much more satisfying on the fingers. And fingers, fingers count when, when you're actually playing the thing. This one, it's surprisingly finicky to play at parts. Like, you, one wouldn't know if uh, one just listened to it. But uh, it sounds easier, but it's much harder than the other ones. And also, in a way, not fun to play. But uh, for sure, we went through some kind of insane story and adventure here. All right, thank you very much for listening. I'll leave you here next time, maybe next weekend, or the following one. You'll be worth more than a day in advance this time. I, I've got some things I'm interested in playing. All right, thank you very much for joining and see you next time.